Thanks to MPB for sponsoring this video. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this video is all about the photo quality of the Fujifilm X-T5, a high-end mirrorless camera with a 40 megapixel APS-C sensor that was launched in November 2022 at a price of around $16.99 or pounds. If you're interested in the video capabilities of this camera, check out my separate review, which I'll link to here when it's ready. Both my photo and movie reviews were made with a final production X-T5, which becomes the second camera in the series to use the X-Trans 5 HR sensor, which made its debut on the X-H2 a couple of months ago. Fujifilm's strategy of gradually trickling down its latest sensor across the range means we'll almost certainly see the same X-Trans 5 HR in multiple bodies going forward. So in terms of pure photo quality, they'll all be essentially the same. Where they'll differ is in terms of body design, controls, ports, composition, accessories, and of course the price. Some video features will also vary, but I'll leave that to my other review. Like most Fujifilm cameras, the X-T series was originally devised for photography first, a joint flagship alongside the X-Pro for those who preferred SLR styling over a rangefinder. As Fujifilm's technologies improved though, the X-T evolved to become more adept at fast action, sports and wildlife photography, as well as growing into a very capable tool for videographers too. And in turn, the body gradually beefed up to better handle bigger lenses, while also acquiring a side hinge screen. The earlier X-T4 became their most capable all-rounder to date, but by trying to be all things to all people, it had arguably lost some of its original charm and appeal. When Fujifilm introduced the X-H1 as its new flagship, I was initially a bit confused to the positioning, but now with the X-H2 and X-T5, their strategy has become clear. The X-H series has become their true flagship, debuting their latest technologies with the least restrictions and aimed at those who demand the fastest speed and the greatest video capabilities. The latest X-H2 and X-H2S have now taken the pressure from the X-T series to be all things to all people and allowed the X-T5 to return to its original roots as a photo-oriented camera. Now, whenever new cameras are launched, it's a great time to check for bargains on used or older models, not to mention seeing if you can sell one that you don't need anymore to offset some of the cost of an upgrade. Either way, I head to MPB to find out. MPB is the world's largest online platform for used photo and video gear, so if you've got any kit that you're not using anymore, just head to their website for an instant quote. For example, at the time I made this video, MPB offered me £845 for an X-T4 in light new condition. Now my quote was in pounds because I'm in the UK, but they're also a global platform operating across Europe and the US. MPB's quote also includes free doorstep pickup, and once they receive and confirm the condition of your gear, you can choose to accept the quote and receive the money in your account the next day. No post office, hidden fees, or disgruntled buyers to deal with. Or if a previous model is good enough for your needs, try searching MPB for a used model. I found plenty of X-T3s available from £709. I've been using MPB for several years now and I've always had a positive experience with them. So when you have photo gear to buy, sell or trade, I'd recommend checking them out at mpb.com or using the links in the description. Right, back to the review. At first glance, the X-T5 body looks a lot like the X-T4 with an almost identical control layout from the front, top and rear. But place them side by side and you'll notice the 5 is a little bit shorter and narrower, albeit still not quite as slim as the older X-T3. Pick them up though, and the 5 is impressively 50 grams lighter than the 4, weighing 557 grams, including the same battery. That's only 18 grams heavier than the 3, and a noticeable 103 grams lighter than the X-H2, while crucially sporting the same IBIS unit and battery. Remember, the X-T3 had no IBIS and a smaller battery. As such, you're getting a compact but comfortable and well-built body with the same degree of weather sealing as the X-T4 the same battery as the X-T4, and the same sensible control layout too that will appeal to fans of vintage cameras. This includes dedicated and lockable ISO and shutter dials on either side of the viewfinder head, with color controls underneath to adjust the drive mode, or switch between shooting stills or video. The exposure compensation dial remains unlockable and may accidentally turn when you're, say, pulling it from a very tight bag, but I didn't experience any issues when using it this time. Note that both the ISO and EV dials also have C positions which allow you to transfer control to the front finger dial. I also like the way that Fujifilm cameras take you straight to the relevant customization menu by simply pushing and holding the button or the dial in question. 
And speaking of which, I feel the finger and thumb dials have just the right pressure for their push to click, which allows you to still turn them vigorously without ever accidentally pressing them to access their additional functions. Oh, and a quick nod to the rear dial, which by default toggles between magnified and full views in playback with a single push, while turning it adjusts the degree of magnification. It's all very intuitive in use. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, one of my favorite aspects of the Fujifilm X system is the ability to keep dialing slower and slower shutter speeds beyond that arbitrary 30 second limit of most rivals. Set the X-T5 shutter dial to the T position, and you can manually select one, two, four, eight, or even 15 minutes without ever having to go near a bulb mode, a special menu, or a cable release. As a long exposure photographer, I find this feature absolutely invaluable and better implemented than any other system. And it gives me the excuse here to try out the new sensor for this kind of work. So here's a shot I took with the X-T5 and XF23 1.4 WR fitted with my Lee 7.5 filter system and a 10 stop ND. This is a two minute exposure at F4 on 125 ISO shortly after sunset with noise reduction disabled. And I'm pleased to say it's virtually bereft of hot pixels. If you'd like to learn more about long exposure photography, check out my tutorial all about it. The only control that doesn't quite hit the mark for me personally though is the joystick, which still feels unnecessarily small and pointy compared to other brands. I feel it would benefit from something a little bit more substantial, but again, that's just personal preference. I should also mention I accidentally turned the drive collar a couple of times when adjusting the ISO dial above it. So maybe it could do with one of those little push locks on the lever to prevent that from happening. Still, it's always fun to capture some surprise HDR images, right? Moving on to composition, Fujifilm is stuck with the same 3.69 million dot OLED viewfinder panel of the previous X-T4, albeit now with a slightly larger 0.8 times magnification. That said, it's hard not to look a little bit enviously at the slightly higher resolution 5.76 million dot panel of the X-H2 and S. This is one of several differentiators between the T and the H line. And if you look closely with them side by side, you will notice it on the finest details when composing. Plus high resolution displays are always handy when confirming manual focus. That said, unless you do have them side by side, you probably won't notice in general use. And on the upside, at least it's not the 2.36 million dot EVF of the Canon R7. The screen though represents a bigger difference between the X-T4 and X-H series, swapping their side hinged articulation for something closer to the X-T3 solution. As such, it'll angle vertically up by just over 90 degrees and down by around 45, while pushing a button on the outer side will unlock a sideways tilt of about 60 degrees, and that allows comfortable low compositions in the portrait orientation. It won't however flip out to face forward or back on itself for protection. Screen articulation has always been a bone of contention for Fujifilm owners. Some prefer the speed and the discretion of a simple vertical tilt, whether they're shooting stills or, or indeed filming video behind the camera. While the little side angle option does at least allow more comfortable shooting at unusual angles when you're in the portrait orientation. I think it's fair to say a lot of XT owners felt almost betrayed when Fujifilm switched to a side hinge on the X-T4 and they'll be absolutely delighted by the return of an X-T3 style. But equally, I've already heard from many 4 owners who miss the side hinge. Not necessarily for its inability to face forward for those who present to the camera, but the chance to flip it back on itself for protection. It is literally impossible to please everyone, although Sony is taking a shot with its latest A7R Mark V, which appears to offer the best of both approaches, albeit lacking the physical stability of one approach or the other. Even though I personally miss the ability to frame myself when filming pieces to camera, which rules out the X-T5 as an all-round solution for my own work, unless I'm using an external display, I think that Fujifilm has made the right choice for this series. Ultimately, if you want a new Fujifilm body with a side hinge screen, go for the X-H series, or perhaps a future XS model. Sure, it's frustrating if you wanted the vintage controls too, but in terms of offering multiple body approaches, I feel Fujifilm does offer a lot more options than most. Before moving on to the internal performance, a quick note on connectivity and accessories. The X-T5 shares the same ports and twin SD card slots as the 4, which means you're still not getting a full-size HDMI port, a dedicated headphone jack or a faster CF Express slot in order to support deeper bursts and the highest bitrate video. 
Beyond the reduced bursts and slower flush time though, most of these will only be issues for videographers and again resolved by the X-H2 and S models. And even as a hybrid shooter myself, I wouldn't personally regard any of them as deal breakers for the 5. The battery is the same NPW235 introed on the X-T4 and also used on the latest X-H bodies with Fujifilm claiming 740 frames in economy mode or around 90 minutes worth of video. Perhaps a more contentious differentiator though is the lack of a battery grip for the X-T5. Unless we forget, a battery grip accessory of varying capability has been available for the entire X-T series, dating back to the original X-T1, with more recent versions accommodating two additional batteries, tripling the overall life. They're also useful when shooting with longer or heavier lenses, but now it's no longer an option for the X-T5. And in the absence of electrical contacts on the base of the camera, any third party solutions would need to employ some kind of stalk and sacrifice the body's own battery. Like the flip out screen, Fujifilm's basically saying, if you want these features with the latest sensor, you'll need to spend more on the X-H series and forgo those vintage dials. This will undoubtedly frustrate the Venn diagram of XT lovers who want both the grip and the retro aesthetic, although I'm told that the take up for that accessory wasn't particularly large. I certainly understand Fujifilm wants to differentiate between the models and provide reasons to spend more on the X-H2, but personally I feel that killing the grip accessory for the X-T5 is an unnecessary restriction. Moving on, the X-T5 inherits the built-in stabilization of the X-H2 and S, providing it with up to seven stops of compensation with any lens you attach. This is an improvement over the previous X-T4, and it's great to have it in a slightly smaller and lighter body. To show it in action, here's two photos I took with the X-T5, fitted with the XF 35mm f2 lens, which doesn't have any optical stabilization of its own. Both shots were taken at a shutter speed of a sixth of a second. On the left is the version with the X-T5's IBIS disabled, and on the right is the version with IBIS enabled. And taking a closer look reveals how effective the stabilization can be. The old one over the effective focal length rule to avoid camera shake has become less accurate as sensor resolutions have increased. And on the day, I required a shutter speed of around a hundredth of a second to completely avoid shake with this lens and with IBIS disabled. Once I'd enabled IBIS on the X-T5 though, I could enjoy pretty much the same result at a sixth of a second, and that corresponds to four stops of compensation. Although if I return to the stabilized image at a sixth of a second and swap it for a version taken one stop slower at 0.3 seconds, it still looks pretty good. So I'd say it gave me four to five stops in practice, at least with this particular lens. IBIS is also invaluable when it comes to framing. Here's the view with the XF35 with IBIS disabled before enabling it in the menus and returning to a much steadier view. This makes it much easier to achieve precise compositions, especially at longer focal lengths. Since most of the lenses you want to use with the X-T5 to maximize its potential resolution are unstabilized primes, IBIS is a very important feature to have. Moving on to autofocus, the X-T5 unsurprisingly inherits the same system of the X-H2 and S, and as far as I could tell, the same performance too. As such, one of the highlights is subject detection for animals, birds, and a variety of vehicles. Although like the X-H models, this is separate to the existing human face and eye menu, making it feel a little bit bolted on. Surely all subject types should really be on the same menu like other systems. But anyway, here's the single AF mode in practice using the most recent XF23 1.4, wide open at F1.4 of course, and a single AF area in the middle where the camera quickly refocuses between the two bottles without any fuss. And next for the compact XF35 F2 set to F2, which may wobble a little as it settles on the more distant bottle, but the process is still quick and accurate. Certainly the X-T5's autofocus didn't let me down or get in the way during any of my day-to-day -day use. Single AF mode in the middle is easy though, so here's another test with the XF23 1.4, but now with the camera set to continuous autofocus, using all for the full area, and with face and auto eye detection enabled. You could see the system identify my eye with a white frame as soon as I entered the picture, after which keeping the shutter half pressed turned it to green to indicate tracking. And to show it working on an older, more affordable lens, here it is again with the XF35 F2, where the auto eye setting is doing a good job at focusing on the closest eye, and again keeping me identified in pretty much full profile. 
Note how the system found another face in the background as I temporarily left the frame, proving someone's carving skills were certainly more human than others. Not me, I should add. Since portraiture is an important subject for the X-T5, I also wanted to make one more test, but this time indoors. So once again, you're looking at the XF23 1.4, wide open, and the system finding and tracking me as I move around the frame pretty easily. While Fujifilm's AF system can still occasionally find faces in compositions without any presence, I feel the system does work very well when there is a human in the picture. Plus you can set one of the function buttons on the camera to quickly toggle it on and off if it gets confused. If you'd like to see the AF system in action for bird or vehicle, action or wildlife photography using longer lenses, check out my photo reviews of the X-H2 and X-H2S. The drive options are also inherited from the X-H2, albeit on the X-T5, coupled with less buffer memory and the inability to use fast CF Express cards to clear it. As such, the top speeds may be the same, but you'll be taking fewer images in a burst. In my own tests, I confirmed the X-T5's top mechanical burst speed of 15 frames per second, even with continuous autofocus, where I was able to capture 329 large fine JPEGs before the camera slowed. That represents over 20 seconds of action at the full resolution, so it should be fine for most scenarios. Plus, the buffer emptied almost immediately when I was using a fast UHS-2 SD card. But for RAW, the X-T5 is much more limited than the X-H2. I managed to capture just 20 uncompressed RAW files before the camera started to slow down, which represents less than a second and a half of action. And once I stopped shooting, I was waiting about 10 seconds for the buffer to completely clear. And while slowing the mechanical burst speed to 10 frames per second effectively gave me unlimited JPEG bursts, I could still only capture 20 uncompressed RAW files at this slower speed before the camera again began to slow down. In contrast, the X-H2 captured 136 uncompressed RAWs at 15 frames per second using a CF Express card or 68 with SD in my tests. Switching to the electronic shutter allows you to shoot at up to 20 frames per second, but with a 1.29 times crop resulting in smaller images. Once again, I confirmed the actual speed in my own tests, managing to capture 603 JPEGs across 30 seconds, or 22 uncompressed RAW files in 1.1 seconds. In both cases, the buffer took around 10 seconds to fully write onto SD memory. So while the burst speed on the X-T5 is the same as the X-H2, the actual burst depth becomes another differentiator. If you're happy to shoot JPEG only bursts, I don't think you'll find it an issue in practice, but raw shooters will need to think very carefully about whether 20 frames at a time with pauses afterwards as they fully flush will be sufficient. Just before moving on, here's a burst taken with the mechanical shutter on the X-T5 while I'm panning across the scene, showing how the buildings are upright as indeed you'd expect. Now for the same panning action, but using the electronic shutter at the full resolution, where the sensor readout speed has resulted in visible skewing on the tower and the buildings. Place them side by side and the difference is pretty clear. Like most non-stat sensors, the X-Trans 5HR suffers from rolling shutter, so as always, use the electronic shutter with caution, ideally for subjects or compositions which aren't moving quickly. If you want less rolling shutter from Fujifilm, you'll need to pay more for the stack sensor of the X-H2S. Okay, now for actual photo quality, starting with the various menu options. Like the X-H2, the top resolution is 7728 by 5152 pixels, but two low resolutions are also available, and each can be recorded in a choice of five aspect ratios, including 16x9, 1 to 1, 4x3, 5x4, and the native 3x2. Raw files are available in uncompressed, lossless compressed, or lossy compressed formats. And you can also choose whether to record standard images in JPEG or HIF formats. As you'd expect, there's the full selection of 13 film simulations to choose from, one of the delights of the Fujifilm system. And if you go for one of the monochrome simulations, you can also apply a color tint effect if desired. It's all standard stuff for Fujifilm, and since the actual photo quality itself was identical to the X-H2 in my tests in terms of resolution, noise levels, and dynamic range, I thought I'd present some new results for you in real-life comparisons with some different lenses. If you're interested in my technical charts and other tests and analysis, do check out my X-H2 photo review, as everything I say about the photo quality there equally applies here. So here's Brighton Pier, photographed with the X-T5, fitted with one of the sharpest lenses in the system, the latest XF23 1.4 WR. 
as I zoom in for a closer look, it's important to mention that while you can mount any lens on the X-T5 and enjoy more than 26 megapixels worth of detail from them, you will be wanting one of the better models to make the most of the full 40 megapixel resolution. To illustrate this, I've put the XF23 1.4 on the left, with the original XF10-24 zoom on the right, adjusted to deliver the same field of view, and both set to f4 where they delivered their crispest results for this subject. As you can see, the zoom on the right is visibly softer and resolving less detail. Again, this difference would be noticeable on low resolution models too, but I wanted to show it here. If you want more potential detail, the X-T5 inherits the pixel shift mode of the X-H2, which uses the electronic shutter to capture a quick burst of 20 frames while subtly adjusting the sensor in between. These are then combined in free software afterwards on your PC or Mac into a file that theoretically boosts the resolution while also reducing color moire artifacts. So here's a single 40 megapixel frame on the left and the pixel shift version on the right, both taken moments apart using the same XF23 1.4 lens. As seen on the X-H2 before it, pixel shift certainly has the potential to capture and reveal even finer details on some subjects, but equally suffers when anything on the frame is in motion, such as people walking on the pier, waves on the sea. To be fair, most pixel shift modes face the same problems, so they remain best suited to completely static compositions under control conditions, such as studio-based product or archive photography. Just before wrapping up, I wanted to mention some of the other photography features that are often overlooked in reviews. Let's start with the interval timer, which automatically captures between 1 to 999, or indeed infinite images until you stop it, at intervals of 1 second to 24 hours. Next are multiple exposures, which allow you to take up to 9 consecutive images and combine them using additive, average, light or dark rules. The X-T5 shows you the composite that you're working on so far, making framing easier and it lets you retake the previous shot if it's not worked out for you, but you can't load a previous image from the card and you also lose the composite so far if you turn the camera off. Oh, and you've been looking at a double exposure using the additive setting. Next up, bracketing, found in the drive menu where you can select between exposure, ISO, film simulation, white balance and focus. For AE bracketing, you can have two, three, five, seven, or nine frames from one third to three stops apart. And you can set the camera to take them separately or in a burst. In focus bracketing, you can choose one to 999 frames with a choice of 10 step sizes and an interval of zero to 10 seconds between each frame, but you'll still be compositing them yourself later in your own software. There's also the full selection of advanced filter effects and the panorama mode, which stitches together images and camera to deliver a particularly wide or tall image, albeit not with the same resolution as manually stitching photos yourself. In my own tests, I occasionally found banding on some panoramas with constant flat colors like a clear blue sky, but this can sometimes be alleviated by manually fixing the aperture, shutter and ISO values. Just play it back after you've taken it and make sure it looks okay. And finally, there is of course built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, which works pretty well with the current app, at least on my Android phone, for embedding location details, although I still have variable success when it comes to wirelessly copying images onto my phone, again, using the Android OS. Sometimes it works perfectly, but at others it can take ages to carry out or not happen at all. There's also wireless printing directly to compatible Instax printers, but like most Fujifilm cameras, this is limited to the older Wi-Fi based models rather than the newer ones that use Bluetooth. It seems bizarre to me that the only X-series camera to support direct Bluetooth printing to Instax printers is the XS10, and even that won't talk to the latest Square Link model. Don't they want to sell more of these things? Which brings me to my final verdict, during which I'll show you a bunch of images that I took with the X-T5, mostly fitted with the XF23 1.4. As always, you can access the original images via my review page of the X-T5 at cameralabs.com. The Fujifilm X-T5 packs the 40 megapixel sensor and built-in stabilization from the flagship X-H2 into a slightly smaller and lighter version of the X-T4 body with the screen articulation of the X-T3. Impressively, it's only 18 grams heavier than the 3, while sporting the bigger battery and IBIS unit that were both lacking from that model. As such, it's literally the camera that many of the Fuji faithful have been waiting for, with a feature set and design aesthetic cherry-picked for photographers without getting bogged down by the technical demands of pesky videographers or action shooters. Fujifilm's strategy at the top end of the range has now become clear. 
if you want it all, including a side hinge screen, battery grip, deep buffer, fast card slot, high res viewfinder, headphone jack, full size HDMI, 8K video and internal ProRes, the flagship XH2 will give it all to you. And if you're willing to trade 14 of those megapixels while handing over a few hundred bucks extra for reduced rolling shutter, then the XH2S has you covered. If, however, you can live without any of those features and only want the XH2's pure photo quality in a slightly smaller and lighter body with the classic XT exposure dials and a screen that tilts rather than flips, then the XT5 is the camera for you. And it's 300 bucks or 200 pound cheaper than the XH2 as well. Plus, presumably, there'll be other variations going forward for those who want the same sensor in, say, an X Pro or X100 body. In theory, everyone should now be happy, although in practice there are some who preferred the direction of the earlier X-T4. Owners who essentially want the feature set of the X-H2 with its flip screen, optional grip, improved EVF and fast card slot, but in a body styled with the vintage chic of the X-T series. I don't know how many of you are out there like this, but I have had a roughly equal number of comments on my X-T5 preview either cheering or weeping. There's no denying the X-T5 giveth and taketh away, but the bottom line is Fujifilm has made its decision on positioning, at least for this generation. The X-T may remain high-end, but is no longer the flagship that has to please everyone in terms of performance and features. Indeed, by cementing the position of the X-H series at the top, the X-T now has become free to specialise and have some more fun. Ultimately, while I think the X-T5 could have been granted an optional battery grip without particularly treading on the toes of the X-H2, I feel Fujifilm has otherwise made wise choices on what to include and what to miss out. I'd say the X-T5 is the perfect upgrade for owners of the X-T1, 2 and 3, not to mention a compelling entry for those new to the system. I certainly loved shooting with it, and guess what, it's not bad at video either, but check out my separate review all about that. As always, I'd love to hear what you think, especially if you own a previous XT model and are thinking of upgrading. Has Fujifilm made all the right choices, or are you frustrated that you're being directed towards the XH line and sacrificing your beloved dials? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, and thanks again to MPB for sponsoring this video. If you have any photo gear to buy, sell, or trade, check them out at mpb.com or using the links in the description. See you next time. Bye bye.